Hello everyone. Hospitality is going through a lot of turmoil and um, changes. In the, in the past, hospitality industry has evolved from many such changes and many such events. So in order to understand what are the opportunities that we are facing with, what are the challenges that we are presented with unprecedented pandemic, we may need to look at back how the hospitality industry has evolved during different times, during different opportunities, during different crises. Every crisis in the history, whether it was world war, whether it was the Gulf crisis, the financial crisis, hospitality industry has evolved much stronger. In this uh, short video, we are going to look at what has been the history path of the hospitality industry around the world, what has been some changes that uh, the hospitality industry has encountered with and how we cope with it, how did we enhance, uh, how did we emerge out of these opportunities. So to, to discuss that today, we have two gentlemen um, who are industry veterans. Mr. NMS Neil Kantan, he has been, um, uh, he, had, he was in the first batch of IHM to pass out when they just established and he has been teaching at IHM Pune. Um, he has been pivotal and he has been a great teacher. He has uh, written a book as well, the, uh, the Love, Affection and Respect, a teacher's ode to his students. And he has also been mentor on the, to the various students and various prof hospitality professionals in real life. He is also the head of academics at eHotel Management School uh, and creating the useful courses for uh, the industry professionals. The second person that we have here to discuss is Mr. Rajat Kapoor. He passed out of um, IHM uh, New De uh, Pusa, New Delhi in 1991 and then he started as a management trainee with the ITC hotels was the front office manager of the Taj and then also a member of their pre-launching team of the Pizza Hut, KSRs. Uh, after he established the Pizza Huts um, in India, he uh, and franchised out all across the India. He joined Jet Airways uh, and uh, also to, to, to launch the first flights in uh, with a Delhi based crew of 100 cabin crews and then now he is working with the General Electric for last 20 years after moving back to USA. So welcome Rajat and uh, Mr. Neil Kantan. I am looking forward to have a useful discussion for our listeners uh, that so that they can understand how the hospitality industry has been useful for uh, learning the and how what we can learn, how we can evolve uh, during this current crisis. I'm reframing this. Mm -hmm. uh, ah, Rajat, uh, it is such a pleasure having you on uh, our chat here. And uh, knowing that you have such extensive and wonderful knowledge about the history of the hotel industry, what made you so interest, interested in this history of the hotel industry? See, the, the belief that I've always had is the fact that, you know, um, the hotel industry has its roots going back into um, ancient times. And, you know, that got validated by the fact that if you look around, uh, really, you find traces of the existence of this industry from way before modern times. And when you try to kind of dive in into understanding modern times, it, I felt it was essential to understand what the backdrop was, where did this concept start from. It may not have been called the hotel industry back then, but the idea is that it is a it, it's in its capable foundation, really, of where we have come from. And the tomorrow is going to really resonate and you know, build upon from what has been done in the past. And I was deeply interested only because I see a connection and without understanding the past, it's very difficult to predict and understand the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so where do you think we start? Do we go back to the, so where do you think the first, uh, where did you find out the first uh, catering establishment started in India? Abroad? So if I where? look at it, um, you know, when I was doing my research for one of the projects, which was my final year project, which is incidentally there, at least I had given it to the um, archives, the National Archives, uh, at least back then in 1991, um, uh, 
Um, uh, when I started researching it, I found that the, you know if you go into the genesis of it, the um, industry itself started um, with the concept of the Sarais, of course, in the Mughal period, but earlier than that, the Dharamshalas. So the Dharamshalas in the ancient world, uh, you know, is is where this concept started from. Back in 321 BC, there are some early um, you know, um, as you can call it, um, mentions of uh, the the people traveling and, uh, you know, requiring accommodations and food. And therefore, you know, you had the advent of um, either um, uh, in the earlier days, the ashrams. So if you look at it, you had the ashrams. The ashrams kind of led to dharamshalas. The dharamshalas led to the sarais. There is a very good genesis of how this development has happened. But if you look at it in Chandragupta Maurya's time during the Mauryan Empire, when the Grand Trunk Road, which we call it as today, what it is known as, was built, you know, which connected um, Bengal right up to Peshawar and beyond into Afghanistan, that 4,000 um, odd kilometer road, um, you know, that it used to bear in terms of the traffic, uh, required people to stay somewhere. That that road or that connection required people to stay somewhere. And therefore the advent of um, along the road, ashrams of sages, etc., that were utilized or dharamshalas. And subsequently we had obviously the, the fact that we had the Sarais and then the in concept that even came into India. Um, so how they traveled by caravans, you mean? The caravan Sarai? The concept, the caravan concept. A very romantic picture, caravan Sarai, traveling by day, staying by night. Actually, that concept is more specific to North Africa and to Saudi Arabia and the Ara Arabian Peninsula. They had the what? caravan, were essentially the ones that carried, um, you know, salt, gold, spices, etc. across the deserts from the more uh, greener pastures onwards to the northern side of the, you know, continent in Africa or in Saudi Arabia. The same story. In India, we didn't call them the caravan sarais. Of course, if you look at it, the Islamic um, reference to it is from those who have traveled from Africa. They called it Kar Karma Sarai. So Karma, Karma Sarai. Be a caravan, if you come to think of it from that. There is a lovely, a good Hindi film, which is very popular, famous that time, hit, called Karma. Correct. The 70s, so, correct. So the concepts came in from there. Um, the, the, obviously, the, the, I would say that, you know, if you look at it when Ram, uh, in Ramayana. Let's go back into history even at that time. Ram in Ramayana when he was traveling, he did stay at ashrams or visited ashrams. Anytime you visited an ashram, you were being fed and you were being provided shelter. That could be considered the earliest advent of really uh, the, the way in which the Indian system of hospitality developed. And of course, during the Mughal period... Long, has long way back. Long back, yes. And the Sarais, of course, have come in uh, subsequently when more of the road transportation using a horseback and elephant back became common. That was the time when this became a, a, a model, which is called as the Sarais. So, um, yes, uh, it was meant for travelers carrying merchandise and trade material or as well pilgrims. Because many people, if you recall, uh, you know, would travel from the south of the country to come to Banaras for pilgrimage. They would come there because Kashi was considered the land of um, the holy land or the holy place, the holy city. Then you wanted to come there for pilgrimage. And if you had to travel across the country, where would you stay? You would stay in these kind of, uh, you know, establishments where food and shelter were both being provided. That well, is like Adi Shankaracharya, saints like him, you mean? Absolutely, absolutely. From okay, Kaladi in Kerala all the way to Kashi and up, up to Kedarnath and Badrinath. Absolutely, absolutely. You did the, they were 12 dhams or the 12 Jyotirlingas, as they used to call it. And even from the Hindu system, you know, you had to visit the 12 Jyotirlingas to have a real true pilgrimage, including Kashi. Kashi itself was one of the Jyotirlingas. So therefore, when you did the, uh, you know, the travel across to the 12 Jyotirlingas, you were traveling across forests and um, uh, open land and you needed places to stay. So this is how the advent of this kind of a system developed. And then, of course, it became more refined, more established, more firm. And this all came out as a result of my um, spending time in doing some research while doing my uh, project back in 1991. And that's what, that's what got me very interested in the history of, uh, you know, of modern hospitality 
um, you know, because there's an ancient route connected to it. And it's not only in India, if you look at it globally as well, the Roman, um, you know, uh, roads, as we used to call it, which used to connect Rome to all parts of the Roman Empire had a lot of the, um, you know, uh, the inns which were created for horseback riders, for people who were carrying mail, etc, etc. Those were all uh, kind of, you know, well-established um, uh, proofs of how this industry developed. So you mean to say the Chandragupta Maurya, uh, this was Grand Tank Road at the time of the Silk Route almost? So Silk Route was a concept which came about more connecting Persia to, um, you know, to China. And, and of course, there was a line that or a route that came in into India as well through, of course, the passes in the Himalayas. But that was called the Silk Route, while ours was more specifically, uh, you know, our own travels that happened because of the extensive empires that overruled India over the ages. If you look at it, we have a very deep history. Um, the first person who kind of had a large, you know, um, uh, oversight onto the Indian subcontinent was Chandragupta Maurya. Ashoka Maurya expanded it as Buddhism also expanded subsequently. So if you look at it historically, the, the, you know, the Silk Route came a little after our own Indian system to come to think of it because the Silk Route was established at the trading route uh, in from the um, Persian Empire standpoint and even taking it up to um, literally Constantinople and beyond into, um, you know, into Europe, into Rome. Because as the uh, Roman Empire expanded and it became more of being, you know, based in Rome as well as in Constantinople. Constantinople, if you look at it, is the modern day Istanbul. That is where the trade and commerce and the large Roman Empire started to happen. But I should even point out another thing. If you look at it, the real road from Europe to India opened as a result of the one individual. Uh, that was Alexander of um, Macedonia. Alexander of Macedonia came in over all the way down to uh, India, uh, and that was the last stop before he turned back um, in his global conquest. So if you think about it, he has gone ahead and he's opened uh, a sort of a trade route, which also became back a part to, of the larger... Just going back to now the uh, Serais. So you mean after that initial Serais, and the next record that what you shared with me earlier was at the Mughals in 1600? Yes, if you look at it from the initial Serais, uh, which was really, if you look at it, a large uh, place which uh, had communal uh, family facilities where you could sit um, you know, sit down, rest a while, uh, feed yourself and, you know, with you or your fam family, you were in a large establishment um, where you would sleep for the night. Uh, that became, you know, started off even really, if you look at it, during the um, Delhi Sultanate, because um, although it was formalized during the Mughal Empire, but if you look at it, uh, the GT road in its modern construction, much of it can be attributed to a man called Sher Shah Suri. And Turk. Sher Shah Suri, sorry, go ahead. You had a question. Turk. The, well, Turk he, was an Afghan. he was an Afghan. He was an Afghan. So Sher Shah Suri was an Afghan who, who was actually from uh, Sasaram in Bihar. And when he uh, became the emperor of India, when he deposed Babur for about five years, he made his capital in Jaunpur near Allahabad. And between Banaras and Allahabad. And when he made it its capital, he obviously wanted to link the northern part of his empire to the southern part. So the old Chandragupta Maurya Road, which was out there, he converted it into a more formal structure called as the Grand Trunk Road. And that is when the real Sarai started where, you know, you could have these, uh, you know, travelers on horseback or chariots or even foot soldiers and people just walking, coming over, sitting, you know, finding a spot for themselves, keeping their, you know, goods and provisions safe, cooking for themselves, being able to kind of get a fresh refill for water and other kind of condiments and food articles that they could carry to cook on the way before the next Sarai came their way. So really, if you look at it, uh, Sarai's, as you've rightly captured, is uh, really, you can call it the melting pot of cultures. Because, um, you know, it, there were different kind of travelers traveling, and there were different kind of people with different backgrounds coming in and to stay no over common there. Currency. No common currency, right? Well, yeah, there was, if you look at it, the common currency could have been just exchange of material and uh, goods also at but, times, but there was no formal, you could have some kind of a gold coin or a silver coin being traded or a mohar, they used to call it a mohar in those days, a mohar being used as a, a method for paying for goods and services. But more often than not, it was really uh, utilizing what you had uh, with you in terms of any any unique item like silk or um, you know, some kind of a precious stone or um, anything that was unique to your area where you were coming from that you were carrying with you. Barter. 
border system. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. So the sarais, there would be, there would the sarais. I mean, where the traveler, the earlier sarais, uh, they try, they had to come and cook their own meals. But in the new Mughal sarais, they were fed, they were given the free food, and the lodging, and so there's a huge difference. Yeah, isn't it? Very true. Under very the Mughals, true. the uh, sarais, from whatever little I know, they built the Mughal sarai, such a famous place. And so I think they started this question of this, this category, uh, the sarais of being uh, different, different levels. So Mughal sarais meant for the obviously the Mughal empire, the office officers traveling on duty. Yeah, if you look at it, uh, you know, it comes about like this: that the empire was big, there was more money, and when you had more money, you could provide for your people who were traveling. It was like the concept of the dark bungalows, which came in in the government times. If you look at it, the dark bungalows are really a more glorified form of the same sarais. What were the dark bungalows? They were for government officials going to collect, uh, you know, um, land um, revenue and staying someplace. So if you look at it, that is how the advent, it started from government officials. Uh, it, let's say it started with travelers and pilgrims. It became formalized under a large empire with lots of money into a more formal place for uh, soldiers as well as um, administrators to stay in. And then the generals, of course, and the larger, bigger administrators had more formal quarters. You look at it, it became then into the dark bungalows during the British Raj. So in a way, this is, this is the... The circuit houses. The circuit houses. There you go. It's, that's exactly it. So, you know, I think you've captured it right here as you look at it. The hotels today, budget, luxury, they, that's, that categorization is not new in India. It happened back then almost about, um, you know, you can say two centuries ago, even during Chandragupta Maurya's time, an ordinary pilgrim would stay um, in an ordinary uh, rest house or a, dharam, you know, a guest house of an um, ashram. Whereas the king, if he were traveling, would have a tent of his own constructed for him in advance and his retinue would stay over there. So if you look at it, categorization had already started. Compartmentalization was already but happening. Formula, formal thing started then in the Mughal time. Correct. The Mughals uh, formalized it to the point where they actually made a more regimentalized approach where depending on your rank and depending on where you belonged in the, the hierarchy, you would be kind of, you know, rested and taken care of based on your level of, um, you know, importance in, in the system, as they call it. And then, of course, you've got the details of how you got the Bibi Kasarai and Chandni Chok built by Jahan Ara, Sajahan's daughter. But Sajahan, if you see, came in in the 1600s. We are going back two centuries. So historically, we've got a lot of evidence of um, this kind of formal um, the, the development from very, very informal roots, as we call it. Which so got you mean more to say we were much ahead, India was much ahead of the world in terms of... Well, yes, planning? I mean, if you look at it, yes, because the Indian culture can be traced back to 5,000 years. If you go back to historically, the presence... Now, we I don't consider Mahabharata alone to be a, a, a epic just written on the forms of the Odyssey or the Iliad by uh, Homer. I call it that there was some proof of existence. And in the Mahabharata times when the, you know, the, the um, so-called rulers from the various parts of the world, what does Mahabharata mean? Mahabharat, Greater India. So if you look at it, people were traveling from the greater part of India to come in and, and uh, come in to meet, uh, you know, their relatives and friends in Hastinapur. And the war happened between really relatives and friends, if you look at it. But when these people were traveling, there were obviously the you know, ability to accommodate not only them as rulers, but also the people who were traveling with them. So frankly, if you look at it, I say our history goes back 5,000 years. Our history, in fact, even goes back to Ramayana, if, as I mentioned to you. But in Ramayana, there was not that formal method. In Ramayana, what was more happening was that, you know, Ram and his retinue stayed at sages and seers and sadhus places, which were called as ashrams. So you, if you look at it, there has been an advent and a development from almost 5,000 years ago. More Something like a modern day hotels. Something like a modern day hotels. Yes, yes. I mean, if you look at it, it started with what in modern days was really a motel, which has now become all these mega five star hotels, you know, uh, with categorization for budget travelers, for business travelers, for VVIPs. But all of that is really, um, that categorization always existed. So it now just, that we have captured uh, India and Therese, what about US? You're a widely traveled man. What about USA and the Europe, the history there and the evolution there? So I will, I will give you a You've seen hotels, you walked, checked into many big hotels, like the, I know you told me about the Astoria, Waldorf Astoria, so. Yeah. 
So if you look at it, um, you know, hotel industry against in Europe, which was really the predecessor of much of this formality, as I call it, uh, started off during the Roman times. Roman times for formalized this, uh, you know, but after that, during the 16th century, if you open it over, uh, you know, that is when, when the Europeans traveled over. Europe was a little bit more advanced. Uh, America was really a, the new world, as we call it. So the Europeans, when they went in over and, you know, much of the development that had happened in terms of caravansarais or really, as they call it, the horse, um, um, horse um, stables, which became like the formal residences for travelers. So you have to remember that horses needed to be changed or fed or, uh, you know, kept fresh. So as they would check in, there would be these stables where you could exchange horses. And at that very places, you actually had people who could stay over, uh, you know, park their carriages and what have you. So by the time this concept came in into the United States, you already had in England and in much of Central Europe, uh, much of these, um, as you call it, um, a carriage um, uh, places of um, accommodation for the night. Um, and those became kind of the motels of the early years. And uh, the concept moved to the U.S. and suggests that in the U.S. the concept shape in large, uh, you know, motorable roads being developed. And as a result of the motorable roads being developed in the United States, you see the advent of the motel industry in the U.S., which is the predecessor of the large five-star hotels, as you call it. But we should also look back on Africa. Africa gave us a very unique thing. Um, you know, salt trade, and I'm going to touch on it before we go in into the boom and the industrial revolution. The salt trade in Africa led to a lot of caravans traveling um, up uh, north to the uh, Mediterranean Sea across the desert. And in the desert, you had the oasis. The oasis kind of became the de facto. Why do you call it salt? Uh, Why do you call it salt caravans? The salt caravans were very important because salt was being traded in uh, Africa, and you have to look it up as a Smithsonian research that was done that salt was being traded pound for pound with gold because people needed salt to keep their food articles fresh sure. or at least maintained. So they were trading gold for salt back in the days. Europeans That's needed the, the salt? I'm sorry, what's that? Did, did Europeans need the salt? Who needed the Europeans salt? Europeans took the salt, yes. Europeans took the same salt from Africa. They oh, took Africa. the same the, you, from India as well, if you look at it. That's why you had yes, the salt in Niagara. Dandi March. Dundee March, yes. So these are all linked portions. See, we have to remember, we don't dive in into history as much to understand that two or three things have led to a, a large change in how things have happened in the globe. Sugar was another such yeah, reason. If you look at it, um, funnily, Indians, how do you see Indians in, in Fiji Islands and in Caribbean and in Mauritius and all of these places? The Indian indentured diaspora, labor. indentured laborers. Why? Because That's it British. was sugar cane. Sugar cane. Fiji, Indonesia, all these places. Correct. Java, etc. Right? Correct. So, so what happens the next after the US and then we go to you said the post the post industrial revolution. Let's talk yeah. about that. Yeah, let's get into the you mentioned that about a minute back. Yeah. So if we go in over into the industrial revolution period of it, and if you, um, you know, the industrial revolution it started off, um, you know, primarily in the in Europe in around the 1760s, and uh, that is when you know you started seeing. Uh, development happening, people moving from an agrarian society to a more uh, industrial society. People were leaving their farmhouses and traveling to the cities to work over there. And that too led to really uh, the concept of people wanting to stay um, in, in accommodations that they could kind of, you know, um, uh, afford or, or um, they could provide, they could be provided for. The steam engine was another thing that brought about, um, you know. Well, I mean, a big change, the steam engine. Steam engine was one of the largest changes. I mean, if you look at it, the wheel was the biggest because without the wheel, you wouldn't have had the chariots and without the chariots, you wouldn't have even had the, uh, the engines. So if you look at it, I call the wheel as the biggest development in humankind. And because of the wheel, you have even the steam engine, etc. And of course, then ships, because you could carry people from different continents uh, across large oceans. Um, if you go back again into history, and so much for history, the Phoenicians were already traveling in the Mediterranean area with uh, their kind of outriggers and ships that they had got for trading with uh, Arabia. The Arabians were traveling with their dhows and their kind of, you know, riggered ships to India. You see a proof of this when people travel, you need to provide for them. So going back to our industrial revolution, the same thing happened. The steam engine allowed more people to be carried than a carriage would allow. And as that started happening and people started traveling longer distances, the need for accommodation and shelter became very evident. 
and that is the time when the industrial revolution led to the growth of the hotel industry uh, in europe and the same thing then transferred over to uh, us and in the us the land being larger wider and bigger um, not only did the engines that came in um, you know help with the bringing the land together because uh, places like chicago places like um, you know kansas city places uh, you know such as these in the middle help connect the west coast to the east coast through train lines um it was a big event because as people were traveling across trains um you needed accommodation for these people and so if you go forward the first boom period for hotels if you click on it uh, you know a little bit more you will see that that is the point in time that um, you know you had uh, large scale openings of hotels happening in cities like um, copenhagen in europe and um, in in new york city in new york city you had obviously the growth and development of large and fairly large reaching upwards of 200 rooms um, which is where you know that city had become the center of commerce um and that is the way in which the history of the us developed in copenhagen uh, of course for europe and then in england you saw that uh, the royal hotel in london was built in the 1800s um you have of course in paris uh, louis the uh, 14th was very well known for being um, rather um, or, you know extravagant in his um, way to spend he opened the palace vendome over there um a lot of uh, complexes came up in those days for high you know high end banqueting so you see that the hotel industry grew as a result of at uh, the demands for more sophistication even in the middle the wheel and then the engine and then the development and the traveling the ship the shipping the shipping of course the shipping and of course airlines first the wheel up. first the wheel right as said yeah first is the wheel we have to remember that without the wheel you wouldn't have had the chariots without the chariots you couldn't have even conceived moving even uh, carriages because the wheel is the one that led to all of this development happening i think the road and the wheel first came the wheel and then came the need for a road and examples like the gt road and the uh, you know the roman roads are examples of how in order to have carriages travel across you needed formal roads so it's a strange connection that the wheel and the road have gone together for centuries and even in the modern times if you see the road um, the growth of roads the eisenhower roadway system in the us led to really the um, uh, the growth of the motor industry in in detroit you see um, us at one time was known as the um, motor capital of the world detroit was the motor city or motown as they called it and in motown you had chrysler ford and general motors producing cars why do were so many cars produced in the us because you were driving great distances now you had the capability to do, do so but one must remember a very interesting thing here folks about um, you know how did the us system start this credit has to go to and strangely enough a man called it all adolf hitler hitler created the first of the roadway systems in germany the autobahns the autobahns actually precede the us eisenhower roadway system the us in a way followed very very strangely and very very interestingly a concept set up by adolf hitler during the second world war when he started giving so called um, jobs to uh, young germans by putting them to work on the autobahns the same very autobahns became the freeways of the united states eisenhower when he was a soldier he must have been to germany as saw it and he Correct. came back he became president and then uh... You mean correct? Correct. That is exactly how the system went. It was um, best practice sharing. I always say there's always a lot of best practice to be shared and learned from, and I think that is what has happened in this case as well. Now we get into the point called as the turnabout phase, and if you want to just click on it, um, you know we can get in into a little bit more of discussion on the turnabout phase, Manish. So if you click on it, um, you know we talked about uh, hotels opening in New York City. Uh, upwards of 70 rooms going up to 200 rooms 794 794 you had the city hotel in new york uh, you had um, uh, earlier hotels were operated out of buildings that already existed so they were converted into hotel rooms and and you know used for that purpose but really if you look at it um, uh, since the um, almost 1800s rooms started being built in formal structures called as hotels Uh, from a formality standpoint that was in 1829 the first modern hotel the tremont house in boston was opened which had really toilets also included with the room system they had locking <laughs> systems and they had uh, food from an a la carte standpoint you could really order for what you wanted to eat from a published menu rather than being fed what was being made that day 
that sounds like so tribal, so backward, you know. That before that, no locks, no toilets had the room. Correct. And, and no a la carte menu. If you look at it, the development, of, little, little, little by little, little inch by inch, is developed. Yes, exactly. I mean, if you look at it, the caravan sarais did not have any formal um, bathrooms and what have you. I mean, you were using the well and you were going out into the fields. If you look at it uh, from a very informal standpoint, but that is how people have. See, in India, you did not have the challenges of cold weather and climate as challenging as in the uh, parts of Europe, etc. So, if you look at it, building toilets in house. Became a lot more relevant and lot more important in places where cold weather would have a you know, very different impact on human beings. Therefore, if you see, these are all linked to how the human species had to evolve based on their climatic situation, based on their uh, needs for for um, you know comfort and and uh, personal preservation, as I call it. Mm-hmm. Of course, so then you have the the, cold- what happens after the whole hotel now. Oh. The Holt Hotel is what led to the growth of really the um, uh, elevators, what are called as the elevators. Otis elevators, which are in use now, or Schindler elevators, really came about from the, the growth of um, hotel industries and large buildings, which are skyscrapers. Uh, if you see the the skyscraper city was Chicago, which is where the first skyscrapers came up, and you couldn't climb thirty, forty floors just um, yourself, so you needed something. So when the elevators came in or the lifts came in. that opened up the the concept of the very large hotels coming up and then you see um uh, you know uh, the, the large hotels like uh, waldorf astoria like the palmer house hilton we get waldorf astoria where do we go from this uh... Whole hotel. After that, do we go straight into somewhere else? We still stay in the same. We go in into um, we go in into really uh, the growth of um, the hotel industry per se. But um, you know the the specific mention was that with all this growth happening in the hotel industry, Lausanne in Switzerland decided to open a hotel school. Which became the first formal school for hotel education because people needed trained staff. So if you see okay. that was again a very big uh, evolution that happened. But let's get into the evolution of the modern hospitality. Is it still, uh, still the same Lausanne, Switzerland? Still Lausanne school that is there? Exactly, the very same. So that's the super. That well, it's it's one of the finest in the world. Correct, correct. Of course, after that you have Cornell, which has come in, and you've come in with, um, you know, places such as New Hampshire. Now, of course, in India you have our own uh, institutes of hotel management. You've got Welcome Group Hotel Institute in Waksha, Manipal, as we call it. So, you know, these are all roots from the concept that started in Switzerland. Super School of Hotel Management, OCLD. So, what's the learning department? Uh, well, accepting that it was more of a management training program rather than you know training people from ground up right right outside of uh, high school, etc. So different versions, different views in how um, the hotel industry and the need for trained staff led to the growth of the hotel schools as well. Now, coming to the evolution of the modern hospitality industry in the twentieth century. Yep. So if you click on it, uh, Manish, we can get in and a little bit more deeper into it. So, if you see uh, Caesar Ritz, the, he was called as the hotelier of the kings and the king of hoteliers. He was a Swiss national, a legend, and the very famous Ritz that you hear about today. Uh, he opened the Ritz at the Palace Vendome in Paris, and that is where you have the concept of the Ritz Carlton hotels or the Ritz hotels coming about, really. So, um, in in the Ritz hotels, which are now a part of obviously a larger chain, um, which has become a part of the Marriott Group, uh, started off really as um, you know as as um, a, a concept in Europe, which spread to the U.S. after that. And in 1999, the Ritz Barcelona, Spain, um, opened the hotel, which had the ability to provide hot and cold water also to people in their toilets. Earlier than that, hot water had to be boiled in a separate location, brought by buckets and other means in order to be given for like the guests. Hot water in the well stations, India. Correct. Running hot water, and the boy gets running, comes running in with a hot bucket, a bucket. Correct. Correct. If you look at it, these are all developments that have happened in 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 yeah. So um, you know, if you go forward, the 20th century is referred really to uh, the point where it was the prosperity phase for hoteliers, and that was because you saw the Savoy in London opening up, you saw Saint Moritz in uh, you know in the Alps coming up with ski resorts, you saw more and more of people starting to travel, and more so because. the airlines after the second world war had started uh, getting established and as you started flying across for a leisure you needed accommodation so much of this is again as a growth of the human spirit as i call it 
then we come in into the impact of the chain hotels and uh, you know events such as those so if you look at it in the us uh, conrad hilton had come up with a concept which led to the growth of um, you know the the uh, the hilton group you had ezra statler which led to opening the buffalo statler hotel in buffalo city uh, you had uh, really of course other statler hotels in cleveland and detroit that came up and uh, in uh, you know uh, europe had uh, started off with world war but us was not affected by world war 1 because it wasn't happening on their continent so really if you look at it um, you know henry ford was able to develop um, the motor city um, as you call it detroit by producing the ford motor t and uh, with that the assembly line production led to more uh, volume driven car growth in the us um, you know and as i mentioned eisenhower had a taste of the uh, autobahn being developed in the in europe and he came about and got Uh, plans to develop the us um, you know uh, approach to it and therefore you know the again um, motels etc started but one has to remember that in the 1930s while um, the europe was uh, dev- you know fighting the second world war or getting into it us was dealing with the great depression and um, even though the great depression was happening that was the time when a hotel called as the world of astoria got commissioned and that was the first one to come up with the room res- reservation system I can, you know, really say with great pride that I've stayed there. I've spent. Which one is that, Nalya? Yeah, so it was it was something um, unique to be. But a great pride as a hotelier to go and stay there and say this is the place where I learned about, and where they started the first reservation system. Yeah, 1990, uh, 1980. Until that time, was, till that time, there was no reservation system. You just had to go and check whether the hotel rooms are yeah, available or not. Yeah. you had to walk in you had to see if they had accommodation for you. You could not reserve a room in advance. It was on first come first serve basis. So 1929 is landmark day here, World of Astoria, and uh, first time they were introduced reservation systems. Correct, that is correct. And of course, so then what happened after World War Two? Yeah, World War Two brought about a different um, growth in the travel because you see, 1939 to 1945 is when World War Two happened. While it was a destructive thing, but it brought people together. You know, you had Americans in um, uh, in Europe fighting a war in on that continent. You had Britishers fighting in Burma and in um, China and other places. You had Americans fighting in the Pacific. So you see, you know, and, uh, and Germans fighting in North Africa. So there was a cross pollination happening where people were at work. um and women were joining the industry as well at that point in time and the men were traveling out to fight and even women as uh, red cross soldiers to different continents and they were getting exposed to something different and if you look at it when those people return from those lands specifically when soldiers who return from um you know europe brought about the uh, roadway system or what is called as the freeways as i mentioned already because they say oh, saw the hint of it in europe where large uh, tank contingents were being moved on these autobahns that were created in germany only for the facilitation of this kind of uh, you know uh, mass army movement as i call it and of course that came in the ford car company and we talked about it that the uh, the growth of the freeways and the traveling salesmen the traveling toothbrush salesmen as we call it they would leave every monday morning in their cars and come back on a friday evening back home but in the middle they were really um, staying at um, different in different cities and different uh, locations which are called as motels so that is the advent and the growth of really the post world war situation when and they went on the road when they went on the road traveling so where did they stay during that time so that is where they would stay at any um, uh, you know farmer or uh, you know any kind of person who was willing to give them shelter in the night but that then became a concept of becoming a motor hotel which is called as a motel it started with people staying in um, you know places where they were running out of food or they were running out of gas and they wanted to go and get to a gas station and close to that they could get some food and therefore in those areas people started opening so if you look at it the second phase was really when uh, you know chain hotels the concept of chain hotels come in Uh, holiday inn was one of the first ones which began pushing out the smaller motels out of business uh, and started building more of the um, you know the larger properties along the same path where the mo- motels were and that's how you have the name holiday inn and holiday inn express these are places in towns where earlier the motel the inn the inn is a word huh? you mean the key term yes find out holiday exactly. inn So the Holiday Inn is really the same thing. I mean, if you look at it, it was the innkeeper, the inn, 
uh, that is the place where you know holiday in came in that it could be even for people taking a holiday it could even be for travelers who wanted to stay in in any any of these uh, facilities which were mostly to be found around motorable roads over here so the next point of course was that uh, you had the jet engine the jet engine is the one where you know the the concept of using uh, air which was so far used for more war purposes uh, became a little bit more formal because the aircraft from being fighters and bombers became more wide bodied civilian planes the boeing 707 was the first wide bodied capacity you know aircraft that had capacity to fly people longer distance and uh, that made uh, europe even achievable as well as hawaii and therefore even places in asia achievable uh, and then hence hotels opened up in places where aircraft could take you and leisure travelers more easily so you see um, growth in mediterranean spain yugoslavia uh, you know where people could fly for holidays and spend the us dollar and that is the strange part as to how uh, the wheel led to the chariot the chariot led to the car uh, caravan or the carriage the carriage led to uh, really in fact uh, even the air, uh, the cars the cars led to aircrafts in the sense you were growing basis the wheel uh, into into you know being able to travel farther distances of course airline was a combination of wheel and flying capabilities as well but that is the the great part of it in india also as you know in 1903 the taj mahal hotel bombay was opened by uh, you know uh, nobody but the great um, uh, grandfather of um, jrd tata uh, that was the um, first big luxury hotel in india built by an indian that by itself is a, is a, is a hall member yeah rn tata the founder Yeah, Nusran Ji, Jamshed Ji, Nusran Ji, Tata. That is correct. So, if you uh, click on this, uh, this concept is an amazing one where you see the uh, we call it the American dream and the impact on hospitality. Um, you know, the what is the American dream? You make money. You kind of you know have the spending power. You you want to spend the money. You go ahead and you spend it on activities that you would prefer. Uh, which we included traveling and therefore if you see uh, you had a car you had the disposable income uh, you had double income in most places with the husband and wife working therefore as a result of disposable income you were traveling um, on these motorable highways and uh, you were going and taking vacations and as you took vacations you managed to get weekend uh, get getways away or you could get resorts and motels which were uh, there to serve you because um, you were taking these quick trips out of your regular time and also you had these annual vacations coming um, outside of the country becoming very popular and therefore you see the growth of the hospitality industry accordingly all over the very strong uh, money that time right to compare the rest of the world correct i mean you see um, yeah that is true you can go into details of the gulf oil boom and boost to conventions and again it is all linked to the fact that money was there there was a construction in the middle east middle east had a lot of oil money uh you could travel there um you know they they were spending lavish amount of um you know money on growing their hotels uh and you had the airlines that could get you there and therefore uh you know conferences and seminars and conventions and large hotels became a a, a way of really a living life and um you had to recustomize yourself hotel had to build themselves regenerate um, revenue coming out of banquets coming out of uh, conferences etc so then came in the need for hotels with 300 rooms or more with banqueting space and this is all a, a development in the right uh, area you also had convention hotels with about 1000 odd delegates that could come in and stay and you, this happened in places like so like las vegas etc so you see a lot of growth in in those areas as well of course you have all of the other things that uh, adds on to it where people wanted to spend time with birthday parties weddings etc that you see in india the lavish ostentatious way of utilizing hotels for these purposes so all of this really point and you, the I, i remember you were the front of manager taj palace hotel delhi which was meant for uh, weddings and conferences and the people actually i would say we changed it we changed it by in uh, 1996 when i joined them we launched the club and dbr floors which are the club floors and the deluxe business room floors till then it was a major holiday, you know wedding destination but it uh, i remember being in a being jocularly known as taj baradkar right correct but uh, it kind of changed because you see the you know you started realizing that the clientele was not fitting your profile so there there's a big decision that is made that you know you want to project yourself differently till a point in time taj palace was conventions and weddings etc 
subsequent to that it more became more conventions and meetings and um, you know congregations as well as business travelers coming into stay and of course then you see uh, the advent of the cruise liners uh, cruise liners are literally hotels in the on the sea um, same for you know 4000 guests traveling at one go um, these are very very important concepts that have led to the growth and the development of the hotel industry or the uh, as i call it the vacation tourism leisure and um, yeah so uh, big big initiatives have been taken by mankind um, and of course if you continue going on you know the impact of the gulf war in the 1990s the recession you had to create a uh, different ways of kind of you know trying to get um, uh, you know people to travel you see the advent of the frequent traveler programs etc both in airlines and hotels so historically if you go back you see many of these events leading to new ideas and new areas of development in the hotel industry of course as as we rightly see you see the growth of the green movement you see a, 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 a you know a focus on trying to be more environmentally conscious uh, you get in into more of um, then um, spending time in uh, you know in in making your hotels uh, relevant for today's world uh, you get in into more of the property management systems coming in at that time in the 1995s onwards for reservations you see growth in chain hotels again um you know crown plaza merging with continental and intercontinental hotels uh you know these alliances they are start getting formed you see marriotts becoming a big alliance as well you see hiltons acquiring hotels so this is all the um, you know the 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 mega developments in the hotel industry which led to consolidations mm -hmm. as you have rightly mentioned marriott one, one, well, i think a point here rajat the green moment and i think we are very proud to be uh, an indian now in this context that is itc hotels ITC hotels where you are a management chairman. I think as the number one uh, hotel chain in the world, leading the green movement. Yeah, it got LEED certified, LEED certification way back in the 1995s itself, which was big because nobody was talking about environmentally being conscious. It's phenomenal, but, isn't it? They're still doing it. They're still doing it very well. Correct. That is correct. That is so true. That is so. We so recently read an article that the ITC hotels are recognized as the the finest in the world for the green movement. So Which is true. Moment for Indians. Very true. Very true. Yep. So uh, if you go on the 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 you know uh, you see the development of hotel um, from hotels into restaurants and you see conventions actually helping uh, to grow really um, you know um, uh, food and beverages as well because still a certain specific point in time almost seventy to eighty percent of the hotels revenue came in from the rooms division seventy percent at least definitely came in but came a point with convention hotels that you did get an into banqueting etc also becoming a key part uh, you know. Uh, and and even disposable incomes leading to food and beverage becoming an important part of of the uh, revenue contributions as i call in a hotel so these are very very uh, till that time the front door manager was considered the number 2 right in the hotel um yes it depended on the kind of hotel the revenue yeah yeah so you know it depended on the kind of hotels that you were in and there was a time when you know hotels had more of the restaurant culture people came in there to eat but after a while if you see in the modern concept no hotel now wants to have their own restaurants at least in the west they outsource it much of their revenue comes in really if you look at it from activities in the uh, food and uh, you know in the in the rooms division side so those are very very important changes one needs to keep in mind uh, that you know as the concept has grown where you outsource much of your um, you know restaurant business to other more competent people at least in the us you will see that that none of the chain hotels run their own real restaurants they only have a breakfast area primarily which is the coffee shop or as you can call it the all day dining but specialty restaurants have been given to people who are good at running it so they've given it to uh, nobukus and the um, you can call it the um, uh, some of the more higher end chains the nobus etc where they go ahead and they um, outsource those those uh, food and beverage options to um, you know people Ashoka, who, who Ashoka are better Ashoka hotel delhi has had done started this also i believe so i believe so in, in india you see that as well that in ashoka they have given much of their outlets away to some of the and more the south indian uh, the lovely south indian restaurant they outsource yes you call that as if i'm not mistaken the um so if isn't that the one which is the one that used to be in the defense colony at one point yes, in yes, the same one same one correct the correct, same one correct. i forget the correct. name the memory fails me now 
Correct, correct. So th- that's the one gap if you come to think of it. So there's been a it's lot of growth. The trend is starting in India of outsourcing the restaurants to the specialty players, the big players of restaurants. Correct, correct, correct. Good. So I think we've covered a lot of ground. Uh, come if you come to think of it, from the starting. uh from really um you know roman roads and uh, the grand trunk road to um, dharmshalas and ashrams to um, sarais to modern five star hotel the hotel industry of course, really not to forget road. from no reservation system to reservation to pms correct correct online so, booking uh, so taking on the really technology and accepting the um, you know the trends the modern trends and uh, you know taking so, things forward it's been the way in which the hotel industry has developed and grown over the uh, over the centuries and and in the last so 50 years the industries the will normal industries will in the face of challenges like all you know, the hotel industry really faced it and evolved it actually doing better with every challenge correct and that is That's what i was saying that is what i was recently speaking to a few students in pusa when i gave a little um you know uh, i was a host for a session with uh, people who had done something different i said we are very resilient people coming out of the hotel industry we have learned to evolve and take challenges and grow with it and absorb technology and new concepts rather easily the hotel industry is a good area where you can see this that you know things have changed practically on a decade by decade basis and of course the last 50 years have seen the biggest growth in technology being adopted uh, but yeah but the, the truth of the matter is that you know this is a evolving industry this is a growing industry this is a industry where new trends and new technologies out in the market is being uh, taken on very um, progressively we will keep adding keep adding we will keep yep. adding keep getting better getting, getting better keep evolving correct absolutely absolutely first stop to this from what we yep. seen now from the last uh, how many centuries from centuries from the humble sarai to the modern five star hotel and five star deluxe and the al burj which they claim is seven star or whatever so it's something worth back the road yep. traveled i mean if you look at it you know the, being a front office guy at least for the first uh, several years of my career uh you look at it we used to have earlier we used to give out keys which were bulky and large and could not have been fit into the pocket of people and you had um, you know what we used to call as the key slots to keep those mag- you know keys imagine a f- hotel with 400 rooms and you had needed 400 key slots um i've seen those days as well i've seen them in mughal agra or the yeah if you look at it the whitney system and you know you moved from there to now really key cards being the given the whitney out. system for at taj mahal 400 uh... Yeah, I worked in it when I did my training at the Taj Mahal Hotel in Bombay. We had uh, 500 rooms there, and we had the Whitney system working for 500 rooms in Taj Mahal Hotel Bombay, and even in the Maria Sheraton, which had 440 rooms. This is a night report, would be terrible. Yeah, night clothes used to be one of the biggest challenges that we used to face, but that was the fun of it back in those days. Uh, in fact, you had to wait for the report to be printed to do a manual check. You had to see whether the keys had all come in. There was a lot of uh, things that that you know we have faced in our days. Check and double check. Correct, 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 correct. Well, so I think you've done very well today for our listeners that looking back at the history of the and the evolution of the hotel industry is an interesting subject. Thank you very much, Rajat. Thank you very much, Manish, for coordinating this. Thank, thank you very much. much. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Neil, sir. You're very welcome. It was a pleasure uh, meeting both of you, and thank you. I wish uh, we could have. We'll probably do something more in the days to come, but this was a good start. Yes, thank you again for your time. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.